Welcome to the webinar series, Thriving Through Occupational Therapy. I'm so happy to be back with you again for this second episode of the three-part series that really highlights how occupational therapy can help while you're living with Parkinson's disease. So in the first episode, I took a step back and gave a broad view of what occupational therapy is and how it fits with your healthcare team. Uh, I also reviewed you know, some examples of how OT can help if you are living with Parkinson's. Um, and if you missed it, that's okay. You can always go back to the APDA YouTube page and watch it again. But today, I would love to cover um, independence with everyday activities. So what I'd like to do now is to um, go over you know, what we are going to review today. So first, I just want to talk about general concepts for achieving independence and why it's important. Uh, next, just kind of to talk about understanding why some daily activities might become difficult um, sometimes for people that are living with Parkinson's. But really, the majority I'm going to spend really uh, going through helpful strategies um, uh, that will give you some good tips with everyday tasks. And then we'll talk about further resources um, for the future. So let's get into it now and um, just start with a, a quick review. So if you watched the last webinar, this might look familiar, but I reviewed the four keys to managing well there on the left. Um, and really, you know, if you think about it, occupational therapy is a part of your healthcare team. So that's what that's kind of on the right is your healthcare team and OT is a part of that. Um, but I did want to uh, note that if you look at the other keys to managing well, exercise, uh, nutrition and support, you definitely will also have other people on your team for that, such as exercise instructors, nutritionists, social workers. Uh, there's um, many different people also that will be on your team in those areas. But those are such huge areas. I'm just going to focus in on occupational therapy with this. So uh, and then the other thing I'd like to review is Again, in the first webinar, I did show this um, model, and this is a model that occupational therapists use sometimes when thinking about being independent. Um, so we, we think about the person in the middle there. They have um, different factors and skills and abilities, so we look at that with people. We also look at the environment and the context that people are doing their activities in. And then finally, we look at these... Um, that see the colorful oval, ovals, those are the occupations that we think about. And another word for occupations really is meaningful activities. So those are the nine areas that we as occupational therapists think about. Um, so I I'm, I'm, don't have time to get into all of those today, but what we are going to dig into when I'm talking about these everyday activities is um, activities of daily living, the ADL, the IADLs, instrumental activities of daily living, and then also the uh, health management too. So I'll be focused more on those things today. Okay, so thinking about, I'm going to, you know, again, kind of give you a little bit of um, what therapists kind of think about when we're trying to help someone be more independent with activities. So we think about it in two ways. First is we think about remediation, which basically just means getting better at the task. So that would be if you're practicing something or if you're getting stronger, if you're strengthening certain muscles, if you're practicing your coordination. Those are all um, very important to do to try to get better at the tasks. Then the other thing that we think about is compensation, and that's basically adapting the task. And we can do that in three ways. Number one is just doing the activity differently. Uh, number two is you can modify your environment to make things easier. And then the third is using an adaptive aid to help. So this compensation piece, that's really what I'm going to focus in on today um, as I review examples. So really, why is this important? Um, definitely, you know, improving and maintaining your independence is, is important. Most people want to stay independent as long as possible. Um, that also helps if any care partners, if, um, you know, who are helping, then they um, 
maybe don't have to help as much if people can be more independent for longer. Um, also, these things can help improve safety, which we're always looking to improve safety and reduce falls because we know that um, if someone has a fall, that that can kind of lead to further complications. So we always want to make sure we're preventing falls and improving safety. And really, this all leads to this concept of aging in place. So that's basically keeping you and your loved ones in your home as long as possible. And most people are, are wanting to do that. And then finally, you know, just making life a little easier. Everyone's kind of, um, you know, it can be kind of fatiguing to do things. And so just making life a little easier is, is helpful. So now what I'd like to do is I'd like to dig into three specific areas that address common um, Parkinson's symptoms, okay? And then I'm going to give examples of what um, things could help with those activities. And I just want to note, um, take a second to note that these are just examples and it's not an exhaustive list. So there's many more ways and things that can help. And so that's why I definitely recommend working with an occupational therapist on a one-on-one -on -one basis. That way you can have uh, very tailored um, solutions. Uh, but, but still, today we're, we'll, I'll give you some examples of things. So first symptom that I want to talk about is slowness and stiffness. So this is the, the two most common motor symptoms with Parkinson's that people will usually experience is feeling slow and stiff. Okay. And so now if we look into what this might um, what this might relate to with activities that you do every day, I call this the ins and outs and the ons and offs. So if you're feeling slow and stiff, moving slow and stiff, you might have um, trouble getting in and out of bed or in and out of the car or in and out of the shower. Another area is maybe on and off of the toilet or on and off of chairs. So now I'll kind of go through each one of these things and give some tips for those. So the first thing would be getting in and out of bed. Um, so many different things to think about when getting in and out of bed. Um, first of all, you can change how you get in and out of bed. And again, working with a therapist would be good because you can practice really a, um, strategic ways to move, the best um, ways to move to get in and out of bed. Another thing you can do is changing the height of your bed. So heights are important when you're thinking about activities. And it's really, uh, you know, you don't want anything too high. You don't want anything too low. So you want it at that right height. Another thing to think about is your types of sheets. So um, friction also becomes problems if you're having you know, trouble moving. And so anytime you can reduce the friction, the better. So satin sheets, uh, people have found to be helpful in moving easier in bed. And then another thing to consider is really which side of the bed you're on. And I know this seems simple, but um, it's amazing, you know, we all have probably slept on the same side of the bed for 40 years. And, but really, you want to think about a few things. You want to make sure you're, it's the closest to the bathroom, um, the most unobstructive area, and also the easiest side to turn. So sometimes people have turn one side or the other is an easier side to turn. So all of these things to think about when moving around in bed. And so um, these are just kind of some examples of that, what I talked about, compensation and adapting how you do things to make it better. But I do want to note that, you know, working with a therapist, they can practice with you so that you can get better um, getting in and out. And that would be that remediation piece that I talked about where you're getting stronger and you're doing the activity better too. But I just wanted to show you a few um, items here with getting in and out of the bed too um, on the next slide. So this would be, um, there's a bed canes and bed rails that are a possibility. Um, so that, that can not only help when you're standing in and out of the, of the bed, but also if you're going to turn in bed, sometimes those can help. And this last one is a transfer pole that attaches to the, from the ceiling to the floor. And then it also rotates. So sometimes people like that near the bed that they can grab onto and then um, stand up with. So next, thinking about uh, getting in and out of chair. 
So this is a big one. Um, you know, number one is learning the proper technique of getting in and out of the chair which is very helpful. Um, but then after that, making sure you have chairs that are a good height, not too high, not too low, a good firmness. And then also, you know, arms are really a must for helping. So these are just some examples here. And then there's also this couch cane. There's there's a few different, you know, little pieces of equipment that sometimes if you add, it can really help um, when you're getting in and out of a chair or out of a sofa. So uh, next we'll talk about, uh, you know, getting on and off the toilet. So the two biggest things for the toilet that's important is to think about the height of the toilet and then also make sure you have arms. So if you are taller, you know, sometimes the toilets can be really sh you know, short and they're hard to get in and out of. So there are items that I don't even have um, pictured here that can raise the toilet, you know, two, three, four inches, and that can be helpful. And then you see these other items also that can add, you know, arms that is helpful for getting in and out. Of course, if you can, you know, install grab bars near the toilet, that's also another option. And I will say, you know, years ago, the grab bars were just kind of the same, you know, ugly um, type of, of grab bar. But now if you look out there, there's a lot of different um, more decorative grab bars that look nice. So just um, know that there's a lot of different options out there uh, for that. So then next, um, thinking about getting in and out of the, sh the shower. Uh, so what I definitely want you to think about is always having grab bars in the shower. And grab bars are really great for everyone in the family because you know, the shower is the number one place where people fall and it's, you know, wet and slippery. So um, thinking about always having at least two grab bars in your shower. So one you want when you step in and out of the shower. That's what you hold on to when you step in and out of the shower. And another one that you have that you hold on to while you take a shower. And these are important things to consult with your occupational therapist so you can get it at the right place and the right height for you and the rest of your family. Um, and I, I, the, the middle picture, I wanted to point out that some grab bars have a multifunction to them. So you can see that middle picture. Also, it's a grab bar, but it also uh, allows, it's a little shelf and you can put some of your items on there. So that's kind of nice when it has more than one function. And then this last picture on the right is a tub grab bar and it clamps on. So if you aren't able to install where you live, you know, aren't able to install grab bars, these clamp on um, uh, bars can be really helpful for a tub and people can hold on to that when they step in and out and it's nice and sturdy. So, and I wanna just take a, a quick note to mention any of these items that I have a, a name above it, um, that's kind of the specific name that these things are called. So if you ever did need to Google those things, you'll probably find that you'll have multiple different pictures and items of that that will pop up for that. So uh, next, talking about getting in and out of the car. So this is such a tricky area. Um, you know, it's very awkward the way that the car door is and if you're managing different things. So this is something to think about. And I would highly recommend, again, working with a therapist with your particulars. But I did want to show you these two items. One is called a swivel seat. And that basically, if someone backs up and sits down and then the, that swivel seat's almost like a... Um, like uh, two pieces there and it has ball bearings in between. So it, it swivels very easily. So then the person can rotate into the car easier than, than if they're just kind of scooting around in the, in the chair. So that's, that's one option if that's becoming um, trouble. And then the other one is this handy bar, which is just a, a small piece of equipment. It's pretty, it's pretty um, sturdy, but you put it in that, in the door, the door jam and it acts as a, extra handle to hold on to and push so you can get in and out and use that because there's really nothing on that that other side of the car when people get in and out to, to hold on to. So that um, can be something very um, handy uh, for people when they, they get in and out of the car. And then when you're not using it, you just take it out of the jam and you, you put it in the side um, door there. 
Okay, so the, that kind of covers that grouping of some common symptoms with slowness and stiffness. But now I'd like to kind of move into if you're experiencing tremor or dyskinesia, the extra movements, or um, maybe some trouble with fine motor control. Um, you know, these kinds of things make all the doing the small things more difficult. So what I just talked about are more bigger movements and getting in and out and on and off of things. Now um, I'll kind of move into talking about when things become more difficult if they require smaller movements. So let's um, kind of take a look. So sometimes, you know, with if you do have trouble with any of those symptoms, it can make these things difficult. Eating, writing, grooming, using a phone and dressing. So those are some co more common activities that can sometimes become troublesome uh, if you have any of those symptoms. So I'll go through each one of those now. So uh, first of all, eating, there are so many different options out there um, for mealtime aids. So just, just so you know, I'm just, just giving you a few ideas here. But one thing is, is utensils. So there's two different concepts with utensils. One is making it bigger is helpful. So anytime, um, you know, you can build up and make something a little bigger, it's easier to grip. And that's really across the board for, for anyone. But the other piece is, is weight. So if you add weight to um, really anything, it can help with tremor. It kind of takes the tremor down. And, and so it's just something to think about that actually a little bit of weight, it can be helpful if you have tremor or maybe a little bit of dyskinesia. Um, the middle one is called a swivel spoon. And so if you have extra movements, that spoon kind of stays more um, uh, uh, horizontal. So it may not spill things as much. And then the the, the things on the right, that's um, handle foam and really foam in general. I wanted to just show that to you because you can cut that foam and you can use it to build up a handle on anything such as, you know, utensils or um, toothbrush or anything like that. So just so you know, that's something that's out there that you can just buy a strip of and cut and, and put it on anything that you'd like. Okay, so next... Um, you know, talking also continuing with eating, you know, sometimes if you do have some extra movements like dyskinesia, the plate can sometimes move around the table. And so there's an item called a dysum and it's this sticky, it's, it's a, it's kind of like a placemat that you put down and it keeps the plate in, in the, the same place. So it doesn't move around. Uh, another thing can be helpful is a plate guard that's in the middle. That's just a, a temporary piece that you can put on a plate and it just helps, it, it builds a um, lip there so that if you're scooping food, it's just a little bit easier and it doesn't fall off the plate. And then also there's tons of different cups out there. Of course, cups with lids are helpful, but also this one on the very right, that's a weighted mug. And so if it accidentally gets um, tipped a little, it, it kind of um, stays upright because it has a weight at the bottom. So just some other ideas there. Okay, so then grooming. Um, you know, these are very, um, uh, you know, small things that we have to do when we're grooming. So toothbrushes, it's a very great idea. Um, the electric toothbrush is very helpful. So if you do like to use that, that's great. If you don't, you still, you like your the regular toothbrush, again, that foam is helpful to use. Um, another item is this dental floss holder um, so that you don't ha have to use, you know, two hands. It's already difficult to floss in general. Um, so that can sometimes be helpful. And then with shaving, if you do have some dyskinesia and extra movements, an electric shaver can be helpful because it's going to, you know, decrease the chance of cutting yourself. But if you do still want the really close shave, uh, there, are, there is something called a safety razor that has some extra mechanisms built into it that so you won't cut yourself as often with it, but it does give a closer shave. Okay, so then now getting into uh, dressing. So, you know, I, I definitely recommend number one, you know, it's just wearing easier clothes that are a lot looser. 
um, and have limited closures. So if you can do that and, and that's good, then then go go for that. Um, sometimes people will add, if you have a favorite shirt, they'll add Velcro. If you know someone that's handy that can sew and add some Velcro. Um, then there's some other items here like a button hook. Small buttons can be difficult. So this is a, a piece of equipment that you can use that helps with buttons. And All right. Well, it looks like Amanda's having some technical difficulties. So I'm Kim Sanders. I'm the program manager here at the APDA, and I'm going to jump in for a second and, and see if they can figure it out. But um, I'm going to continue on with, with getting dressed. Um, she was talking about adding Velcro to clothing, using button hooks. Um, the next thing she was about to talk about is the zipper pulls. Um, so those are easy to just attach to the zipper, um, and it makes it easier to pull your zipper up and down. Other things that you can do are purchase adaptive clothing. So there are some companies that already have adaptive clothing pre-made um, specific for certain things. So um, one of the companies is called Buck and Buck. They have a whole catalog, um, shirts, sweaters, jackets, cardigans, shoes, socks, anything you can think of. Zappos has an adaptive line. Tommy Hilfiger has an adaptive line and Amazon also has an adaptive clothing line. Other things to talk about for getting dressed are your shoes. Obviously, we know reaching down to put on your shoes can be a fall risk. Um, so finding ways to, to put your shoes on that are easier. Um, one thing an OT will always say is, um, if possible, sit down while you're putting your shoes on so that way you're not leaning over and possibly causing a fall. Um, but we want to use things like a long handled shoehorn. So you'll see that in the first picture. Um, shoehorns come in all different sizes and different materials. So that makes it easier to slide the back of the shoe on. Um, there's lock laces. So that keeps your shoelace out of the way. I know sometimes your shoelaces can be really long, specifically if you have to tie your shoe a little bit tighter and that can cause a tripping hazard. So these little lock laces, you just have to be able to squeeze and you pull that lace tight and then it hooks on. So that way it's, it's out of your way, but still feels secure on your feet. Um, and then there's always the Velcro closure, um, which most shoes have Velcro closures um, or can be adapted that way. And then there's also the new um, line. I know Skechers, I think Nike came out with one, has the slip-in shoe, um, where the back of the shoe um, is a little bit thicker and it, and it doesn't slide down when you go to put your, your foot in there and push your heel down. Now we'll talk a little bit about riding. Um, so obviously we know with Parkinson's comes tremors and then the micrographia where our riding can get really, really small. So we wanna work on things that um, can adapt our pens and pencils so that way we're still able to communicate. Maybe we still write checks or we wanna write letters, things like that. Um, so the first picture is just adding a simple grip to a pencil or a pen so you can buy those um, specifically, you know, Amazon, Walgreens, the teacher stores, um, they have, they're just, it's a little rubber grip that just slides at the end. Um, they also make the adaptive design pens. So it holds where you're more supportive in your wrist. So your, your pointer finger would slide down in the middle. Um, and that kind of helps guide your pen a little bit better. 
Other things that we have used um, and seem to help specifically with the tremoring is the weighted pen with the grip. So similar to when you're using your utensils, you also have the ability to weight your pens and pencils um, when you're writing as well. And then there's also things like a custom stamp. So if you're, you know, adamant on sending letters or, you know, signing your checks or your bills or whatever that may be for you, um, you can have your signature written where really, really nicely. So all you have to do is just use a stamp and, and stamp it onto your mail or your check or, you know, whatever your signature might need. Other things we use um, obviously every day with electronics is your cell phone. So being able to adapt your cell phone, um, there's different settings. So Android and iPhone users are, they're very similar in the settings section. Um, they might just look a little bit different. So you'll always wanna go to your settings tab and there's um, a section called accessibility. And in there, you're able to change the display, your text size, your, um, your lighting on your phone, you can make it brighter or darker. You can change where your background is no longer white. It's a, back, a black background with white writing. Um, and then you can also increase and decrease the touch sensitivity, which for those with tremors can come in, in a lot of in handy because you're able to um, turn the sensitivity down on your phone. Um, so that way you can um, tap your phone gently and it's not going to double touch or you're going to end up in, you know, three windows later trying to open up your emails. Um, there's also a voice to text feature that um, most phones have where you're able to just speak into your phone and it'll write out a text for you. So that way when you're trying to navigate or communicate with someone via text message or email, you can uh, just vocalize what you're trying to say and it'll type that out for you. Other symptoms and, and solutions we're going to talk about is when our, with our slowed thinking. So with cognition, you know, our, our, our brains, we, we tend to take a little bit longer to try and figure out what is the safest way of, of doing our daily tasks. So things that are important and, and we, we talk about a lot is maintaining a schedule. So most people will you either utilize their phone or they'll have a planner. Um, and with that, they can maintain a schedule um, to where they're not forgetting things, including their medication. So it's very important to manage in our daily schedule when our medication is gonna be taken, where are we gonna be at, will we have the appropriate things, are we bringing enough medication with us if we're leaving the house for a long period of time. So with that, we have our portable calendars, we have our cell phones, we can set reminders, alarms, um, attaching a routine or uh, attaching to a routine. So um, are you sticking with a breakfast, lunch and dinner type of setting? Are you um, focused around appointments? When we have more appointments, we tend to have to plan our days around those as well. So making sure that we have everything um, we need written down on our calendars. And then taking medication. So the importance of taking our medication on time um, and having it with us when we need it. So there's pill organizers of all different sorts. Um, you can do a weekly or a monthly. Um, there's ones that specifically set to alarms. So it'll alarm you when it's time to take your medication and it opens right up and you can take your pills out. Um, there's also keychain pill holders. So with those, the pills are inside and you can take those with you. They're just always on your keychain, so you have those. And then again, setting reminders, whether it be a watch or your cell phone alarm or just having a timer with you saying, you know, it's it's been two hours or it's been four hours, it's time to take your next dose. Um, it's just something we highly recommend. And obviously we know the importance of taking our medication on time. And then some further resources we have are getting personal, uh, a personalized assessment and recommendations from an occupational therapist or a certified aging in place specialist. So with that, um, through Medicare can be covered with a doctor's uh, order and finding an OT that whether they come into your home and, and they look at your setting and, and do a home assessment 
or if you go to a rehab facility and work on those daily tasks of you know, getting dressed, safely transferring, getting in and out of a chair. There's also local medical equipment supply companies that can provide you with all of the equipment that Amanda and I talked about today, plus an ample amount more, whether it be a wheelchair or you know, your shower benches, your, your lift chairs, um, all the way down to your, your simple daily um, use of utensils, um, sock aids, uh, things along those lines. And then there's also local programs that can loan used equipment. Um, so those will be specific to the area you're from, um, but many of those will accept donated equipment, whether it's something you're not using anymore, or maybe you've grown out of using, um, and, and they'll allow you to rent equipment from them. Other um, equipment manufacturers online are the www.rehabmart.com or www.maxiaids.com. Those are both two websites where you can go on um, and it's more of an online catalog. And then these are our references today. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and, and start with some questions. Amanda's still working on getting back and going. So um, let me see what questions we have and I will get them answered. Okay, so we were asked, is there a bed cane that can be used with an adjustable bed? Um, so with that, many of the bed canes, um, specifically on the adjustable beds, either attach, if it's a metal bed frame, it will have to attach to the bottom. So with that, if it's the head of the bed, it will lift up with you. Um, otherwise, there's ones that will slide completely under the mattress that you can put right below where that adjust, um, the adjustable part of your mattress is where it may be leaning you up. Um, and, and that will keep the cane there for you. Another thing that I saw in the questions, and I love this, um, is someone said, beware of the suction cup grab bars. And I highly agree with that. Um, so you want to make sure that you have um, grab bars that are attached securely to your wall, specifically in the bathrooms where it can be slippery already. Um, those suction cups obviously just don't hold on. Um, so uh, if you are looking for grab bars, I would highly recommend having somebody come in and install those. Um, there are specific com companies throughout the area that also just specifically come in and um, will attach grab bars or assist rails or, or um, more adaptive equipment. Um, we also had someone mention that local churches are a great resource for equipment, and that is so true. Um, it's very hard to find places to donate your equipment. Um, so I know around here in St. Louis, we have um, the Vincent of DePaul where they will accept it. Um, and then they're able to get it to those in need um, because you don't wanna just throw that kind of stuff away. I know a lot of it isn't covered by insurance, so it's pretty pricey. Um, so it's always helpful to have that on hand. Um, someone else asked about a portable chair for traveling. Um, so there are tons, whether it be um, the uh, Drive Medical, they have um, ones that just fold up. It's, a, it's called a transport chair. They have leg rests that easily take, come off and on. Um, and they're very lightweight. They can fit right into the trunk of the car. Um, if we're looking for something that's more of a power wheelchair or a power scooter, those are going to be a little bit heftier in size. Um, so for safety purposes, you want to make sure that you're able to lift those in and out. But many of those will come apart in maybe two or three pieces, um, and that can make it easier for you to put it in your trunk or in the back of an SUV or if you have a lift on the back of the car. Those are all helpful ways. Um, but I specifically would go with a portable transport chair. Those are going to be the most lightweight. Um, someone else asked the lightweight electric mobility devices you would recommend. Um, so that is going to be something that's going to be more hands on with an OT that you're working with, just because it depends on your size, your ability to transfer. 
Um, some things that we look at are, you know, do you want the three wheeled or the four wheeled? And with that, um, it really just depends on the use. Are you, you know, just trying to get out in the community or is this something that you're going to use long term throughout your, your own environment in your home? Um, are you able to navigate throughout your counters, your bathroom, your, your living space? Um, so those are all questions I would ask your specific OT that knows your measurements and knows what your actual needs are. Um, something we had talked in, about in the last session, and I, I will readdress today, is how do you find an occupational therapist? Um, so there is a, a website you can go to. You can Google OT or occupational therapy in your area, um, and the, it can you can search by your zip code. So with that, um, it, it, I would highly recommend finding somebody that you're comfortable with, specifically if they're coming into your home. Many of the hospitals in the areas will have people come out and do home visits. Um, so I would um, navigate through the website, look at who is specific to you, and, and go from there. And from what I've been told, Amanda is back. So I'm going to let her jump back on and, and we'll continue answering questions. Amanda, thanks for coming back. Oh my gosh. Thanks, Kim, for filling in. Absolutely. I really apologize to the viewers. Uh, uh, yeah, just totally lost power here. So, um, but thank you, Kim, so much. Absolutely. We were just going over some questions. I just got done kind of talking about how to find an occupational therapist. Um, we've talked about some some wheelchairs and, and things that people can use when they're traveling in the community, whether it be a power chair or a transport chair. Um, and then we've also talked about how local churches are a good uh, resource for equipment as well. Great. Yeah. Um, so I'll ask the next question um, is, does insurance cover occupational therapy? Okay, yeah. So um, occupational therapy kind of goes under the rehabilitation um, therapy. So something like um, Medicare will cover up to a certain amount if it's with a doctor's order. Um, so you do usually need to have a doctor's order and then um, the insurance should cover uh, most of it, but sometimes there can be a copay or you might be in charge of some amount. Um, VA benefits do, sometimes you can have um, additional benefits with the VA, but definitely um, insurance should cover a majority of your, of your um, occupational therapy visits. Perfect. Um, somebody else said, I tend to lose my balance and drop items to the floor. Do you have any suggestions for that? Yeah. So, you know, I didn't really address that piece. So yeah, that's a good point. So balance can become an issue sometimes with, um, Parkinson's. So what I suggest is always using, you know, good body mechanics. You know, when you get in a small area, sometimes the kitchen or the bathroom and you go to turn, sometimes that can become a trouble area. Um, and so first of all, you know, working with a therapist on good ways to kind of move and be more mindful about how you are moving. Sometimes when people just start backing up quickly, that can that can cause a little bit of trouble. So just being more mindful. But as far as, um, you know, equipment. Of course, uh, we love reachers as therapists. Um, there's all different types of reachers out there. And I suggest, you know, if you are having trouble, you know, maybe with balance and, and picking some things up, having, you know, a reacher and a room or two where maybe you're going to need that more often is helpful. So basically it, it a reacher is a long piece and that has a, a squeeze handle so that you can squeeze things and pick them up. And so if you need to get something up high or down low, that is a nice piece of equipment to have kind of nearby that you can use that. So you don't have to stoop and maybe get dizzy or reach up and things become, um, you know, unsafe. Perfect. Perfect. I'm looking through our other questions. Um, we were also asked, you talked about um, the DISOM and, and the adaptive equipment for utensils and plates and things like that. Is there anything that's specific to like meal prepping that's more, you know, if you're trying to cook a meal and not just eating the meal? 
Yeah, there is a lot out there for that. Um, so there are cutting boards that are adapted um, where you know, they have prongs that come up through the cutting board where you could set, you could put the tomato on it before you cut it, or you can, um, you know, or the potato or whatever. Um, so, and then there's the cutting boards that have the sides that come up. So again, you, you can really, um, use those pieces so that food isn't kind of going everywhere if you're prepping um, in the kitchen. There, there are so many different options. You know, also I'm thinking in the kitchen, sometimes carrying things around from place to place can be uh, you know, unsafe if you're carrying a heavier pot with water. Um, so there are things called kitchen carts where it's just a small cart on uh, wheels that you can place something that's maybe a little bit heavier that you need to move, put it on the cart and just roll the cart over to where you need it and then take the item off. So there are a lot of um, a lot of different items. How about how about for our next uh, our, our next webinar, I'll make sure I kind of include some of those things for the kitchen for home safety too. Perfect. Yeah. Perfect. And we have time for one more question. Um, somebody asked, are there safety features for cars? You talked about the devices that are to get in and out, but is there anything specific, you know, inside of a vehicle that might make it a little bit safer? Yeah, so um, a lot of the cars these days do have some additional safety features that are nice. Um, but I'm thinking like one thing is that lane assist, um, you know, so if you kind of start to get towards a, a line, it'll it'll um, beep or some some cars actually will kind of pull you back a little bit. Um, so that, that sort of thing's helpful. Um, and then also, um, you know, sometimes with if things are in your 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 blind spot, there's a light that pops up on this rear view mirror. That's a nice safety feature to have. So any of these extra safety features that are in the newer newer cars are nice to have. They're just kind of little cues um, that help keep people safer. So yeah, there's there's a lot out there um, more with driving now. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you, Amanda, for all of your knowledge today on OT and independence with everyday activities. I want to thank you all for joining us today for thriving through OT, independence with everyday activities. Please join us on November 9th to discuss OT and home safety. You can register now at apdaparkinson.org. I'm Leslie Chambers, the President and CEO of the American Parkinson's Disease Association. Each month across the country, APDA is providing support groups, exercise classes, and educational programs like this one to support the Parkinson's disease community. You can find all of our upcoming virtual events on our website at apdaparkinson.org events. If you enjoyed today's broadcast, I hope you will consider making a donation to help keep programs like this possible. Your gift can help APDA support people living with PD through local programs, reliable resources, and groundbreaking research designed to find treatments and ultimately the cure for Parkinson's disease. Please donate today at apdaparkinson.org slash donate. And thank you so much for your support. Thank you.